Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be able to uh, welcome Tom Finholt to give a talk here today. Tom is um, doing a sabbatical at the University of Washington in, in uh, uh, this semester and is over here collaborating, talking with people in, in MSR while he's here. He is the senior associate dean at, at the School of Information at Michigan and is an, an expert and has long done research in the areas of cyber infrastructure and collaboratories. He's, he's been one of the uh, key people in the, NS, the NSF and NIH collaboratory uh, oversight reviewing area. Um, um, but today he's going to be talking uh, not so much about collaboratories and cyber infrastructure, but about uh, sustainability and social networks. And I know that there are a good number of people here who are uh, also interested in both the issues of sustainability and social networks, but I haven't yet heard too much uh, done bringing those two together, so I'm looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, Tom. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. So I can just assume this mic is live now. Okay, thanks. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good to see you. I'm certainly enjoying the Seattle weather today. We'll see how it goes in a couple weeks. but. Uh, so uh, the work that I'm going to uh, talk with you about this afternoon is um, a, a relatively new line of research we've initiated at the University of Michigan. Um, and we've just recently received a new uh, NSF award to, to support this. So uh, I, don't, I don't have so much in the way of results, but I've got a lot in the way of hypotheses and direction that we're, that we're going to go. And I want to uh, start by sort of motivating the conversation. I'm sure for this audience, I don't have to motivate it too much. but. Um, uh, we, we are uh, an economy and a society that is highly dependent on uh, fossil fuel and uh, carbon-based energy, uh, oil being the principal uh, driver of the, uh, of the economy. And, um, you know, the, the best case scenario is peak oil is out there 40 years from now, and the worst case is peak oil happened, you know, a decade ago. Uh, it's inescapable that these resources are not uh, renewable. And so there's a very strong societal imperative to uh, reduce our dependence on these uh, kinds of fuels. And as if that was not enough, uh, the uh, combustion of these fuels uh, produces a, a secondary and very dramatic problem uh, associated with uh, uh, carbon load and increased uh, global warming and, and climate change and so forth. So uh, the, the way we approached this problem was to say, uh, what are the things that we can do in our everyday existence that may help with the reduction of our dependence on these uh, non-renewable non energy sources and that might contribute in some way to reducing this uh, uh, climate burden? And I don't know if you if you read the New York Times in the last uh, two weeks, I think there was an editorial by uh, a noted environmentalist who said these kind of uh, incremental individual level behaviors are meaningless and the main thing is to pass cap and trade and you know, create the giant macroeconomic levers and so forth. But uh, there was a kind of, as you might imagine, a, a rather fulsome response to that suggesting that uh, you, you don't create a constituency or an advocacy for those kinds of broader scale changes without enabling people to make the kinds of changes in their individual lives that let them feel like they are contributing and so forth. And we actually feel we're, we're, we're going to be able to go beyond that. So, you know, there is a kind of a, a characterization of, uh, of the uh, weekend environmentalist who is, you know, I went to uh, Lowe's or wherever and bought my carton of CFL bulbs and put them in and now I've done my bit for the environment and so forth. And we want, we want to try to go uh, a little bit beyond that. And uh, one of our uh, organizing constructs is um, uh, dematerialization. And it, it's not something from Buckaroo Banzai uh, or something that you saw in Ghostbusters. It actually is an economic construct. 
And what it refers to is the ability to uh, increase gross domestic product. In other words, increase the well-being of individuals in the society without also increasing ad infinitum their dependence on uh, material resources. So um, I know some of us in this room are old enough to have been familiar with the uh, literature on limits to growth that was popular in the uh, late 60s and 70s. And it, what it did was it it did this kind of uh, Malthusian play where it took the consumption of materials, laid it out on a uh, extrapolation and said, you know, oh my God, we're going to run out of everything in the next five, five to 10 years and so forth. Well, that, that hasn't happened. And one of the reasons why that hasn't happened is through the miracle of dematerialization. And let me just um, uh, make a brief uh, side trip here to, to explain what, what we're talking about. So uh, one, one kind of canonical, uh, canonical example of dematerialization is in the domain of telecommunications. And um, I know that you know what that is <laughs> from your past, right? Uh, this is a, uh, a, a bundle of uh, copper telephone wires. Um, just to give you an idea of the capacity, we'll say something like 24 voice channels, something like 1.5 megabits per second, and so forth. Uh, and that's what the whole world used to run on, was uh, copper wire. Well, uh, copper is horrendously heavy, for one thing. It is increasingly scarce. Uh, it involves quite a bit of uh, nasty extractive uh, industry to, uh, to mine it and so forth. And what's happened over the last uh, uh, two decades is copper has been largely replaced by uh, fiber optics. And this replacement is, uh, is a nice example of dematerialization because these, you know, this is just glass um, and the capacity is dramatically increased. So, you know, something on the order of 32,000 voice channels, 2.5 gigabits per second and so forth. So, so, and you can play that kind of game throughout the economy. And in fact, economists have noted that um, uh, dematerialization is paying off, particularly in the developing economies. If you took where we were um, back in Jimmy Carter's day, if you remember his uh, presidential speeches, some, some would characterize them as full of doom and gloom, um, uh, talking about uh, uh, the need to, to modernize the energy infrastructure and so forth. A lot of that actually was taken to heart. In the United States today, if we had continued consuming on the path we were in in the 70s, would be probably 35 to 40% higher in terms of consumption. So, you know, we're, it's not like we're doing well. So we still have a huge dependence on, on foreign oil. Uh, we're still producing a vastly disproportionate share of the, the world's carbon outputs, but it could have been a lot worse. And the reason it's not a lot worse is because of this miracle of dematerialization. And uh, the developing economies have this down uh, to a science, or the developed economies have this down to a science. The developing economies, there's evidence that uh, Brazil and China are now tipping over into this, uh, into this period of dematerialization and so forth. So we, we took this dematerialization metaphor and played around with it a little bit in the context of uh, some more mundane and everyday concerns that we have. And the principal one was that we uh, received an award from the National Science Foundation to convene a virtual school of computational science and engineering as a partner activity to the award of the Petascale facility at Illinois. And no, that's not actually the Petascale facility. Notice it says interim system. If you've read the headlines recently, IBM just pulled out of the, of the Petascale agreement. So there actually isn't a Blue Waters machine right now. But the money's been funded, and you can go visit the building in Champaign. Blue and, Waters, yeah. Yeah, who knows? Well, the, it's interesting. The Blue Waters Building is the top lead certification, even though it's a giant, you know, giant uh, machine room and so forth. So they had this need to uh, to convene this virtual school, and they they uh, you know could have gone about it in the traditional way and uh, reserved a giant lecture hall on the Illinois campus and uh, flown in you know, the dozens of uh, eager Beaver graduate students who are hot to learn how to paralyze their code and so forth, and then a stream of talking heads could parade in front of them and edify them and l learning would happen. Uh, what we proposed instead was a, a virtual model of this school, taking advantage of some uh, experiments we'd been doing related to the work that Jonathan mentioned earlier with the collaboratories and uh, exploiting uh, capabilities of um, 
this is not compressed HD, but it is packetized HD, uh, uh, moving around within the Big Ten's uh, Gigapop uh, infrastructure. So uh, we can exploit that to create a very vivid and, um, as you can see in this case, Big Brother-ish type, uh, uh, type experience. And then there were uh, multiples of these all over the place. So what we were essentially uh, replacing was the convening everybody in a single place with using uh, a, an advanced network and video conferencing infrastructure to create a multi-site conference where there had been a single site conference. And that was, you know, to be honest, the, the main motivation for doing this was because a lot of us were really geeked about this uh, HD video technology and uh, we wanted to try to demonstrate some of the capabilities to the leadership of these campuses and so forth. That, but then we got to, to think about it a little bit and especially since, uh, we had seen some of these presentations on dematerialization, we realized that we had been doing dematerialization while convening this uh, multi-site conference. And so we actually looked at who attended these things and so forth, and we did a, a kind of a thought experiment. And um, the, the, the one arm, if you consider everybody coming to the single location in Champaign, here's where all the participants were, and these are their flights to get to Champaign. Those of you who've been to Champaign know that you can't actually get there directly. You have to go through O'Hare first and then take a little hop down, uh, down the state. But uh, we have magic airplanes for purposes of this analysis. So this is what it would have looked like. And in particular, uh, it's something like uh, 87,000 person uh, pa or passenger miles. And uh, that's a, a sort of an imputed energy load of about 79,000 kilowatt hours. Okay, that's that if we had done nothing different, that's what would have happened at that meeting. As an artifact of uh, doing this multi-site version, and you can see we didn't, the multi-sites weren't exactly optimized for efficient travel in some cases. You still have, you know, there's some people coming from uh, parts of the east and going to some of these uh, southern institutions. For some reason, this uh, this content doesn't appeal to anybody west of the Mississippi with one exception. And maybe. Maybe they go to meetings in San Diego for their, yeah, who, who knows what's going on there. Um, and here you can see uh, a fairly uh, dramatic reduction in the passenger miles and a, a fairly substantial reduction in the, the energy footprint. And this is through one relatively uh, modest intervention. And so the way uh, we started thinking about this was uh, we realized we were characterizing the power draw of a meeting and that it became possible now to start thinking of, uh, of meetings as another kind of appliance or uh, uh, device that we might put on the grid and that there were things that we could do to change the nature of those meetings to dramatically alter the, uh, the energy consequence. And in this case, this savings of uh, about 30,000 30, passenger miles uh, about 27,000 kilowatts, and that's depending on whose calculations you believe, somewhere in the order of 15 to 19 tons of, uh, of carbon dioxide. And the principal savings is by eliminating the need for the airplane travel. So um, I'm not going to talk about this here, but there was an analysis done by actually a climate scientist who was attending International Summit of Climate Scientists and was struck by the irony of a community of climate scientists all hopping into jet airplanes to fly to London to have their, or yeah, Copenhagen as it, as it was last year, to have their meeting about the threat of global climate change. Um, uh, jet, jet travel is pretty close to the worst thing that we, we can do, and yet it's, it's ubiquitous. It's our ubiquitous solution to all uh, f uh, forms of uh, networking and, and convening and so forth. So, we were struck by this issue of, um, of estimating the power draw of meetings, and then we started thinking about whether we might be able to do the same thing uh, for individuals. And it turns out that there is um, an interesting uh, application on the web that was developed by Saul Griffith called um, uh, Watts On, W-A-T-T-S On, and uh, lets you uh, input numbers, depending on your patients, you know, 10 or 15, or you can get as detailed as you want, and essentially lets you figure out, you know, what you, it, it, it's, think of yourself as a light bulb, what is your power draw? So I, I went through this exercise uh, myself, there's, there's Saul uh, right there. This is actually the 
alpha version of the website. They've now productized it, and it's focused much more on uh, home energy consumption and less on overall energy consumption. But this site is still running. I encourage you to, to go around and, and, uh, and play with it. So I input my numbers into this thing. And it turns out that if I were a light bulb, I would be rated at uh, 4.8 kilowatts. OK, so what constitutes that draw for me? Well, transportation is a fairly significant component of it. And actually, uh, since I became an associate dean, that component diminished. But when I was a regular faculty member, it was t twice as big as that. And in fact, I've seen people who have an uh, order of uh, 70 to 80 jet airplane trips a year. And that you can imagine that that just blows it out. If you remember from the previous slide, about two uh, kilowatts is on the order of the average consumer. And a lot of academics I put in are up above 11, 12, 15, 22. And so, so we are, you know, not only are we the stinky ninth, we're also the polluting tenth or, or something like that. Um, shelter is the other significant component there. So um, I, I did these as if I was living in Ann Arbor. Uh, this component would be smaller in Seattle because your uh, heating season is shorter and you don't have cooling season. Uh, and then the last category is stuff. Now, st stuff is actually an important uh, consideration here because while these things have to do with energy burned or consumed for me to do something, like to get from Seattle to Pittsburgh or uh, to keep my f family warm during the darkest days of the, of the Michigan winter, this is like my iPhone, okay? So if we think about the iPhone, it's, it's consuming power. It's consuming infrastructure resources that have to be powered, presumably in the network, the, uh, the, uh, the, the wireless network, the Wi-Fi network, and so forth. But it also embodies a certain energy cost because someone had to make it, had to be fabricated, it had to be shipped to me, someone had to build a store uh, an AT&T store or an Apple store to sell to me and so forth. And so what uh, the interesting thing about this Watts on site is it's now incorporating all that embodied energy as well as your actual energy consumption. And that's an important thing to keep in mind as we try to figure out where are the dematerialization wins. They're not always so obvious. And um, uh, let me characterize one that uh, is sort of popular but is totally bogus, which is uh, the, the transition from uh, pressing CDs to distribution of MP3s. So on, on the first glance, you would look at that and say, that must be a huge win because, you know, we're not pressing all that plastic, we're not driving it around the country, uh, we're not, uh, you know, all the record stores, you name them, they're all gone as far as I can tell. Um, and, you know, we're just, we're moving these pure bits around and so forth. Well. Not really, because that music has to be stored somewhere. Those servers have to be spun up and cooled. And the, the big problem is all the embodied energy in the devices. So you know, if these things lasted as long as a washing machine does, it wouldn't be so hor horrendous. You know, Washing machines people replace on the order of a, of a decade, or actually my dad was quite pleased to have gotten one to go 25 years. The, these, you know, they're basically this one's probably at the end of its useful life. I think this is a, a 3G. I bought it by two years ago. It was already obsolete when I bought it. You know, the force in two weeks will be obsolete and, you know, onward the, the thrust of progress and so forth. And so what, look, you know, what looks like a, a, a sort of immediate dematerialization win isn't always a win. And that, that suggests that you've got to drill down below the surface to understand what's really going on with a lot of these uh, technologies if you want to do these kinds of uh, energy accounting. And the reason you have to do this is because if you want to try to benchmark or describe improvements, you've got to know where you're starting from. So you can sort of see our progression as we, we got into this by trying to characterize the draw of the meeting. And then we realized that people are the constituents or components of the meeting, so we want to drive down to that low level. And now we're stuck with this problem of we, we can't get thousands of subjects to sit down in front of Saul Griffith's website and answer the, you know, this, this stuff thing. There's, I think, 500 and some uh, uh, things that have been characterized in terms of their embodied energy. Only a, a super geek like myself and my colleague Eric, Eric Hoffer and maybe two or 3,000 others would sit there and do that. So, so what we're looking for is a solution that characterizes this sort of 
energy footprint dynamically. So this is a relatively static slice. You know, you answer these questions once and then you can, you can actually connect to your power bill now and it will update based on your um, uh, electric and gas consumption. If you connect through Fuely, it will actually keep track of your uh, gasoline purchases for your car and if you give the make and so forth, it can impute mileage. But for the most part, this is not a very attractive alternative for gathering these kinds of data. So the, the reason that we want uh, a solution that will be uh, more tractable is that we've become interested in uh, what we characterize as the energy costs of social networks. Now, sometimes NSF program officers in particular are guilty of reading this and saying the energy costs of computer-based social networks. And we're actually about a much broader agenda, which is the cost of maintaining your social network over a host of infrastructures and technologies. And uh, you know, the notable ones would, would be transportation, communications, and computer. And I think uh, reflexively we're oriented to you know, talk about the computers and not think about you know, the bus ride we took, the car we drove, you know, the, uh, the commute, and, and so forth. So uh, just to give you an idea of sort of the, the, the kinds of things that we're looking at, um, this is a, a, a visualization that was done by uh, Aaron Koblen at, at UCLA. Do you, do you know what it is? Email? Uh, no, it's not email. Oh, I can read it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the transportation, it's airplanes. So these are the, and what you've got over here is the clock running in Eastern Standard Time, and if you watch it, you can see the ebb and flow of the departures and arrivals. So here, you know, here the East Coast is waking up, it's activating. Now the West Coast wakes up. Here you can see the incoming European flights over there and so forth. So, so this air transport network is a fairly substantial component of maintaining social network. This is uh, grandpa flying to visit the grandkids. This is families convening for weddings or funerals or anniversaries or reunions. The air airplanes are a significant component of that uh, maintenance and one that we think has not really been attended to. So, you know, if you look at the general social survey and so forth, they're asking you how often did you communicate with someone, but they're not asking, did you drive there? Did you fly there? Did you have a video conference? How, how did you maintain that contact and that you need to know that if you're going to impute these uh, sort of energy demands. So, uh, so that's the, uh, the air transportation network. Then we're also concerned with uh, automobiles and, uh, and buses and other kinds of uh, personal transportation. And then we're similarly concerned with the use of uh, telephones and, uh, and uh, cellular grids and, and so forth. And then we're also interested in the use of, uh, of social media. So um, with respect to the transportation networks, we can pretty easily get people to self-report. Th those are not, um, uh, if, except for a very small fraction of people we might be interested in, those are, not, those are fairly salient. We can, most of us can come up to a, to a reasonable approximation of how many plane trips we might take per annum, um, you know, how many were short haul, medium haul, long haul, and so forth. It's much more difficult for us to say anything about how we're using uh, a computing or communication infrastructure to um, you know, maintain uh, Facebook status or to check in on Foursquare or to send email and so forth. And so um, this has led us to, um, to think carefully about how we might unobtrusively capture that behavior in a, uh, in a grounded way that lets us make accurate predictions or forecasts about energy consumption and then ultimately might help individuals and organizations make decisions about how they should allocate resources. And for example, uh, you know, jet, jet travel might be very appropriate in the beginning of a collaboration, but as the collaboration gathers steam, maybe it needs to be maintained through some less material intensive um, uh, modality like, like video conferencing and so forth. So as, just as we are starting to think about this problem, this movement was born um, around the uh, quantified self. So are, are you familiar with this? Um, uh, 
you know, also known as self-tracking. Uh, they, they had a, a meeting uh, just a few months ago. It's really kind of the first convening of the tribes. And I, I got to tell you that um, I didn't go to the meeting, but, but my colleague Paul Resnick went, and my colleague Eric Hoffer has been, been to other uh, QS meetings. It, it is sort of a combination of camp revival, um, you know, um, maker fair, uh, and just outright, you know, eccentrics and, and weirdos. Because um, a, a good deal of it has been oriented around personal health. And it, 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 some of the origins of this come from uh, the performance athletics tradition. So if you are a, a championship cyclist or a champion runner, you are acutely sensitive to the state of your body and you're very interested in tracking your performance. And that has to do with sort of inputs, you know, what did you eat? What was your training regime? What was the output in terms of, you know, did I gain efficiency? When did, when, if I'm training, when do I need to tail down? When do I need to carbohydrate, carbohydrate load and so forth? And that, you know, basically that was available to a very small element of the population, you know, members of the Olympic team and so forth who had hordes of acolytes who stood around and kept track of that kind of stuff. Well, what's happened with the revolution in uh, personal electronics is that a lot of those capabilities are now accessible to ordinary people. And so you can um, uh, buy systems that let you uh, sort of track your activity levels. There's popular ones for monitoring your sleep states. And uh, as these things have grown and they've been associated with social media, you get the capacity to share that information with one another. So there, there is this interesting opportunity now that you could realistically imagine that we could capture the behavior of individuals across a host of these infrastructures uh, related to the support of social networks in a way that previously would have been intractable or very cumbersome. I mean, essentially, you would have had to do some kind of exhaustive um, you know, field surveys, um, phone interviewing, and whatever. And those are you know, notoriously prone to, to error. Um, uh, people's recollection decays pretty quickly. They, uh, they use the items on the instrument as a, as a gauge for what they think they should be answering. Um, have you ever heard this phenomenon? You know, you, you ask people how much television you watch, and if you move the range around, you can actually move their response around because they choose the middle of the, They say, well, I must be an average TV watcher, so I'll circle the middle. And so I can, you know, I can say 100 to 150 hours or 10 to 1,000 hours, and they're right, they're right in there circling circling that middle. So, you know, it just as in many things, the gold standard would be the actual behavioral data. And so this quantified self movement, as crackpot as it occasionally uh, can be, raises the possibility that there is, there, there is an opening that we might imagine a kind of a personal energy informatics that could then be aggregated and provide a, a data resource that could be exploited, try to tune some of these larger systems in ways that might be beneficial in terms of our larger goal of reducing dependence on these non-renewables and, uh, and the carbon load. So let, let me walk you through um, kind of quantified self uh, 101. So th this is one of the very uh, popular uh, gizmos in the QS world. It's a device called Fitbit. Have you ever seen one before? Yeah. So it, you essentially wear it, and it, it tracks you know, something in the order of four or five to six parameters about you, mostly you know, how many steps have you taken. So it's sort of like the old-fashioned pedometers, except uh, this thing can report on you. And you can upload these reports. And then it can actually tell you, you can see down here, you know, your best all-time number of steps per day. And then up here, it's, you, you know, in this case, Eric has set a weekly goal for steps and are you getting close to them and so forth. And um, uh, these could be aggregated across a population of users and you could start to get sort of a, a real-time diagnostic picture of the activity rates of your organization. Now, I mean, set aside some of the big brotherish aspects of this. It, uh, you know, my colleagues like Paul Resnick have argued that this could be an important tool for motivating healthy behavior because now there's a leaderboard. And God knows Americans love nothing better than a leaderboard to show, you know, that <laughs> I walked 18% more steps than you did, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so this is kind of the metaphor for this QS world is some fairly simple-minded device 
with the capacity to record on uh, a narrow range of parameters, and then they can be uploaded to some uh, location in the cloud and compared and processed and, uh, and so forth. And um, this is a similar kind of idea, but now in the domain of the things that uh, we're concerned with in this project. This is um, uh, an effort on Android platform by some colleagues of ours in electrical engineering at Michigan. And what it is is a, uh, they call it the power tutor. And it tells you uh, not only what is your uh, consumption on your device. So, you know, sort of here you're seeing what the load is from the CPU and here's your, you know, networking demand and so forth. But it actually breaks it out by application so that you can start to see, oh my God, you know, the amount of time I'm spending on Facebook, that is a significant drain on my uh, battery. And so if I could change my behavior, then I would, you know, reduce it and I you know, I would be able to answer the phone when my girlfriend calls me and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, in a, it's in a kind of a microcosm. You have to sort of use your imagination to see where this kind of thing might go. But just as with this other QS stuff, you can imagine this kind of energy monitoring also expanding into the aggregate so that suddenly, um, as I have on the University of Michigan campus, 42,000 some students zipping around town, they are all now sort of uh, uh, sensors, if you will, telling me about the real-time consumption of resources within these infrastructures that are supporting their social networks and, uh, and so forth. So, uh, What's so, the first app? What? What's the first app up there? The screenshot? This one? Oh, this one? I, it's, it's, it's an Android thing, so I don't know. I mean, it's, it's taking pictures of the of the screen. I don't know why that should be so uh, so power intensive. I mean, maybe, maybe they sat their thumb down under or something like that. So. How similar is this to time on each of these apps? That, that I'm not so, I mean, you can actually get that in another, in another display. And so what you'd really like to know is, uh, I mean, there's some things that you that you do a lot, but in a not very deep fashion. Like you might, you know, you might check in and look at Facebook or, or email or something. But then there's other things that you do infrequently that might be very intensive, like watching, you know, videos and stuff like that. So, you know, that would be another that be another dimension that you would that you would be interested in. So, um, as an extension of this, then, is this growing market for. Um, uh, energy sniffing devices, I will call them. So uh, this one is a thing called kilowatt, and you can see you can uh, plug it in between your device and the wall, and it will uh, keep track of the, exactly how much juice you're burning by having all your stuff in a standby mode, which is scary large, actually. Uh, because it's like uh, you know, it's like having a drip in your faucet or something like that. It's not very salient, but it turns out over the course of a year, it's a lot of water. Well, it's a lot of electricity that people are burning away. And you've heard of these? Um, anybody drive a Prius in here? So have you heard of these clubs of Prius drivers who are you know they're high mileage or you know they're trying to see if they can outdo one another in efficiency? Because so, you've got that, you've got all those readouts on the. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are people who are similarly oriented to these kilowatt devices, and they're going around their houses. And, you know, it, it, so we can say that that's kind of uh, a bizarre behavior. And w one of the things we've done in the, well, it's, it's you know, it's unusual. Well, it's, it's probably a little bit harsh to say it's bizarre. One of the things we've done in the NSF award is to say we want to target those kind of people as early adopters of uh, personal energy technologies because they're going to go out and exercise them. And it's, um, you know, Larry Smarr used to say that uh, uh, high performance computing was like a time machine because you, you could see in the moment what would become ubiquitous in, in the future. And so in the same way, we want to take these QS people and use them as our time travelers because they're, we, we believe they're already ahead of the curve. They're already the ones, you know, wearing the, the cuff 24 hours a day, uh, the little Fitbit, plugging these things in all around their homes. They, they're, they're an interesting breed of adopter because they're intrinsically interested in this self-tracking and they will enthusiastically engage. And so what we're, what we're trying to get from them is sort of a snapshot of this intensive use 
as a proxy for what these things might look like if they were deployed ubiquitously. And, and so instead of having 300 observations, if you had 300 million observations. Um, and you know, the way to think about that is, uh, I think um, Barbasi did a study with um, cell data from um, uh, Germany, essentially be, being able to show sort of the the passage of devices through the, the footprint of these things, and you're able to answer all kinds of questions about you know, where people are going and what they're doing, even with these very uh, simple parameters. We, we want to achieve the same kind of thing with these sort of electrical devices. And then this one, WhatsApp, actually will produce reports. Again, so you see the, the analogy to the kind of Fitbit type, uh, type technology is these are now creating a, uh, a market for data that might be generated by these things. And we're, it's, it's very early days. And so w one of the things that NSF is very excited about is whether we can engage people in the use of these kinds of technologies and then correspondingly what sorts of questions might we be able to address if we had that, uh, if we had that information. And from our point of view, the main thing that we're concerned about initially is, um, is the trade-off between the decision to use very energy intensive infrastructure to, to build and maintain these networks versus less intensive. And is, is there, are there obvious sweet spots or wins that we can exploit theoretically to say, you know, that, that really isn't a good reason for you to take a plane trip, right? This would be an occasion when a video conference would be completely adequate but not a video conference like we are accustomed to. This is the quote I was looking for the other day, the, you know, the, the long, dark room with the uh, uninterested parties in the front and the angry person screaming at the end, which is sort of the, you know, the uh, H323 uh, experience of video, you know, enhanced video. And uh, as you can recall from that previous analysis of the multi-site meeting, we've got a pretty hefty power budget to deal with there. Just in that kind of ad hoc distribution, we, you know, we gain back all those kilowatts. It's actually something like uh, on the order of five, 553 kilowatt power budget. Well, there's no way that these technologies are chewing up that much juice. In fact, our, our back of the envelope estimate was that for the virtual school, it was probably something in the order of uh, uh, you know, uh, 50 kilowatts or something like that. So you, you could do much more and still be ahead of the game in terms of the uh, uh, consumption on the, on the jet airplane travel and so forth. And, that, and I think that's a challenge for the developers of these technologies is to try to figure out what more would one do to make it you know, more vivid, more realistic and so forth. And I think we've been in a period where uh, we sort of uh, vacillate between you know, ig ig irrational exuberance about things like video conferencing, and then these sort of Thermidorian crashes where it all it all just sucks. And you know, I know Jonathan has been through at least three of those <laughs> cycles, and you've probably been through a couple of them yourself from the from the Belcor days. And uh, you know, I think there's there's probably more that, that could be done. So that's that's one kind of question that we're interested in. And then the other kind of question we're interested in is whether these large-scale infrastructures can be uh, optimized and, and better balanced. And the metaphor here is uh, uh, the Greenlight Project at uh, UC San Diego. So this is an effort that uh, Tom Defani and his colleagues uh, have. They, they, they basically have a machine room that is completely self-contained, and so they know exactly what goes into it and what comes out of it. They know, you know, they know much, how much power goes in, and how much heat and, uh, and cooling and so forth have to go out. And so you can set that thing up and then run simulations on it to try to see you know, what the, uh, how you might uh, balance and optimize the load. And we're thinking from the point of view of these larger infrastructures to support social networks, there may be things that you can do to sort of tune them in smart ways so that you, you, know, you build in capacity when when it might be required, um, you know, from the transportation system point of view, there's clearly extra capacity built in around holiday periods to accommodate the extra travelers and that kind of a thing. But there may be things that can be tuned on an even more micro basis within, you know, what I would characterize as microclimates of infrastructure. So again, in Ann Arbor, we have a unique microclimate, the 42,000 students, the 
34,000 some staff, the 7,000 some faculty, these are all people who, you know, they are avid consumers of these technologies and we think it's going to be very easy to sort of get them to answer questions and put, put some of these devices on their, uh, on their systems uh, and so forth. So even in this simulation, you're measuring some parameters and, and not others. So I can, you know, decrease my energy drain by letting the air conditioning go up 20 degrees. But that might have consequences about burning out machines sooner. So when you talked about stuff, it was sort of interesting, all the kind of embedded costs. How important is that in some of these simulations? So I can win the game locally by doing things that are not... Uh, from a, a somewhat more global perspective. Yeah, well, that's one of the things we're trying to address with this with this new award is to try to figure out where, you know, where those wins are actually suboptimized. Right. And okay. um, and I think a lot of the rhetoric about machine rooms is exemplary of that kind of um, uh, suboptimal uh, approach. So I mean, they basically uh, the machine room operator has in front of her this problem. You know, I've got to i got to try to get this system to as close to equilibrium a, right. as I can. But they but they you're absolutely right. They don't have to worry about whatever energy cost is embodied in the technology that they're looking at. Now, the, the lead certification actually takes some of that into account. And um, when, I think one of the really interesting de dematerialization arguments is that if you can figure out how to not eliminate but slow your facilities growth, and this has to be an important concern even for Microsoft these days. Um, if you can diminish it, say if, you're, if your facilities growth is on the order of one one percent, which would be which would not be an unreasonable number. If you can drop that below half a percent, the amortized savings are gigantic because now you don't have to cool that space you didn't build, you don't have to clean it. You don't have to furnish it and, and so forth. And at the University of Michigan, we just completed a campaign where uh, we were horrified to discover we actually have the largest physical campus of any institution in the world. We didn't know that when we started. And then we were horrified to discover that not only were we the biggest physical campus, we were growing it at the rate of 1.2% a year, which is truly not <laughs> sustainable. So that we've now reduced that to under half a percent, which means, you know, uh, tremendous benefits with respect to savings, money that can be put toward you know, hiring faculty and all, all those other kinds of things that the university might actually uh, be interested in doing. But, but I, I think you, you are capturing the complexity of the problem. By it's, it's, you know, it's sort of like if you push here, then it squeezes somewhere over here. And l let me add just another layer of complexity, which is um, this principle known as uh, Javon's uh, paradox. So um, uh, Javon was, uh, I'm going to say, an Oxford Don or something like that. He was, he was, he was at one of those institutions. And uh, I, I didn't include his picture here. He's a very proper Victorian ec economist. He, his paradox, was, and this was in the context of uh, steam production, but the paradox was that as you make things more efficient, you can actually increase the demand because the price goes down. So you can have this ironic consequence that we could um, make these things uh, super efficient, but then we can actually offer the services, the cloud services, just to take an example out of thin air. And now people are going to see that lower price and they're going to come in. And so even though we made them 50% more efficient, we increased the demand by 70 or 80%. And so that efficiency is moot in the face of the larger demand. And it turns out that the energy economy has little pitfalls and traps like that all over the place, which is why you really need to take this sort of systematic perspective to try to understand the interdependencies across all of these uh, different factors. Well, since, uh, yes, I mean, they are all over the place. So, and I mean, one example from a place I used to work was that the, the, the part of the company that was involved with energy would say, turn off your computers at night to save energy. But then the IT people would say, turning them off and on every day you know, leads to them burning out in the old days. It used to, they used to lead to them burning out, so they wanted them on, and nobody had the answer as to what the global benefit was. Similarly, though, you know, you mentioned the example of the of the CDs, uh, the the DVDs. Um, what about the kilowatt and the what's up devices? I mean, how you get thousands of tens of thousands of people carrying those around? The production and recycling of those when their life is over. You know, what's the cost there? Yeah. Last one more example, which is down the road. You know, 
for the transportation example, the people who are the people are very interested in that issue, uh, technology and transportation, and that's at Boeing. And they studied it for years, and their conclusion, which feeds right into this, is that uh, we don't have to worry because when because the effects of the internet, the effects of networking is going to mean that people will start collaborations in more distant places and they're going to end up having to travel some time there. Similarly with social networking software, I can now keep in touch with lots of friends from high school and college much more efficiently, but how many, but if just one or two times, you know, a decade I go and visit them, fly to see somebody who I wouldn't have before because they were out of sight. You've outside. trashed all this. Save. Yeah, so, yeah, so they're just so you're right, there are tremendous um, of these uh, paradoxes, right? Uh, right, right. And, and, and then sort of figuring that out from, from a systems point of view is, is one of the aspirations. So that the, the kilowatt and, and watts on, I think you have to look at those as kind of model Ts. And, and to say that, that those are purpose-built devices for hobbyists to sort of keep track of things and then it's like ham radio operators and they share stuff with one another and they can, you know, they can compete and, and that kind of thing. The, the more notable transition is the, the design of the devices with those modern technologies, you know, built in. So you are, you know, you are, it was already, it's already part of the device. It's, you know, it's another bunch of gates or something on one, one of the chips and that's the thing that's monitoring, you know, do we spin up the fans or how do we, how do we allocate the, the juice across the thing? And so, so now it's already, it's, since it's already in the embodied budget for the thing, you're not, you're, you know, you might have paid a little bit extra for that, but then it's making the device that much more efficient and therefore you are, you, you can imagine payoffs down the road, but it's, it can, it can be opaque and, um, but particularly for consumers, who avidly jump to the next thing, you know, in, in two weeks, I guarantee there will be reports on CNN and the New York Times of the fanboys and girls lined up to get whatever new bobble Apple has, has produced, right? And, uh, you know, how many of them would be lining up if they actually had to pay the embodied cost of those devices? Or as people have proposed, when you purchase an automobile, you also need to purchase the end of life plan, which I think you have to do with the Prius, don't you? A little bit, isn't there? Don't you have to pay ahead to cover the disposal cost of the of the battery? I think uh, it's built I into the. That. I think it's well, you didn't see it, but I think it's built <laughs> into the. It's built into the cost of the device, and then there's then I think Toyota subsidizes other aspects of it, so that's not quite. It's still painful. The batteries but are very, were very expensive. Right, and it, it's I think from the point of view of the life of the uh, of the of the material of the vehicle, that's the most problematic uh, uh, most problematic component. So the 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 last thing I would um, um, leave you with here is that um, in our uh, studies of scientists and engineers uh, collaborating, and this this is independent of whether they're thousands of miles away or or uh, tens of meters away. The thing they keep coming back to is, I want some information about when do I switch from one modality to the other. And uh, it's, it's almost like, um, uh, you know, the old hedge used to be a while by IBM because nobody got fired for buying IBM. I, I suppose at one point people said the same thing about Microsoft and perhaps it's Google today. I think it's the same thing about communication is n nobody ever got fired for trying to have a face-to-face -face meeting or for organizing things in a face-to-face -face session. So there's very little incentive to explore uh, at what the intersection might be between conventional meeting technology and some of these less orthodox alternatives that may be, be less intensive. And you know, this, I think it's this inertia that we have to get over across all of our activities. And this is just one that's very salient to us because we run, you know, we, we spent five years playing around with these incredible HD video technologies and we built these, of course, massively energy consuming tiled walls and had, you know, great teas with our pals on the other side of the continent and could never get anyone else interested in using those kinds of things. And so what, what we hope to be able to, to show with some of these data is to start to address question, you know, from the point of view of um, 
uh, a, uh, a surgeon in the Michigan Medical School who right now sort of transparently hops into her car and putters around campus to go to meetings. If we were able to play back to her exactly how much of her life is lost in maneuvering around and how much energy is consumed and so forth, maybe she would start to be aware of these uh, trade-offs and would jump in on some of these other things. And you know, again, that's getting back to this quantified self metaphor. The idea is that as you see your behavior, you're aghast that you, you know, oh my God, I consume 400 calories of chocolate chip cookie every day. I gotta cut that out right away. Or uh, you know, uh, the average is 10,000 steps, you know, a day, and I don't even get that in a week. That's something's seriously out of whack. I'm a strong believer that that. that confronted with the data, people will be able to make the right decision or that clever people will produce apps and services that exploit those data to help you go on to make the right decision. And this is more kind of in the line of uh, nudge and things like that. It's, you know, it's, you, it's not always obvious to you what the right thing is, but given enough data, others might be able to design you know, programs and applications that, that let you move forward. So. Um, here are a few people that I uh, want to recognize, my, my collaborators, and actually there should be two more there for Tom Defani and Larry Smarr at San Diego. Uh, this is our generic uh, Michigan Interactive and Social Computing site. So not, not only is this work represented there, but the work of all of my uh, colleagues, some of which is strongly related, like the stuff that Resnick is doing with uh, personal health and uh, some of the work that Eitan Adar is doing and so forth. And then these are the uh, awards from the National Science Foundation, which we're quite grateful for, and the University of Michigan Office of the Provost has also been a, sp a sponsor of this work. So I guess I guess we're at the end of the hour, but if others have questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have an observation. Okay. Personal conflict, <laughs> and uh, which leads into sort of uh, your study, the, the upcoming study. So the observation is, if you look back at history, um, we've moved from on when needed to always on, right? Mm -hmm. So so a telephone being kind of an example of that, where my mom still has a rotary phone. Right. It still works. Interesting enough. <laughs> Why? I have no idea, but there's still some in New York City, some, and it only uses electricity when you need it, right, right in very small amounts. And so versus, you know, my phone, which is always on and always on. And, and so I was thinking about the fact that we're going to introduce all these monitoring devices, which themselves are always not consuming electricity, <laughs> right? Which, which is like, okay, we're just kind of... And then I think, you know, using my mom as the metaphor again, it's sort of um, that always on. So she's got the rotary phone with, you know, the cord. Right, so she's got to walk to the phone, which means that she gets a little bit of exercise right. <laughs> along the way, right? Which is goes back to the counting. She yep. does it naturally without ever having, having to. She has to walk to that phone in order to do that. And if she's downstairs, she walks up the stairs to the phone, versus me just pulling it out of my pocket. So she's always, you know, uh, you know, just by life, the way of things are. I think she's naturally and very, very efficient. She's probably. The mo she's far more efficient than anybody else. Even if I were to put a solar panel in the house, she's going to be more efficient than me, just from her work, pra her her habits and practices. Just just to flag that point, there was an article in the New York Times this morning by uh, a food writer who's, who's been on a little campaign against fast food, and uh, one of the things he noted was that uh, over the last uh, two two and a half generations. Uh, that Americans have become, it's not just fast food, it's all food production in general has become incredibly inefficient. Mm -hmm. And one aspect of that is we don't actually use very much of the beast when we eat the beast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be that every bit of the beast was precious it. and, you know, you had tongue and you had tripe and you had all that other stuff, which, you know, my kids, <laughs> they never even heard of. And, uh, you know, it's, my wife says that her mom in Western Michigan had a big jar of tongue on the counter all the time, and that was a staple for sandwich. So, so, that, so I think this plays into this general theme that there's, you know, that there's, it's not sloth as much as it is just like abundance. Yeah. And that's the way to sort of the issue that I thought with your study, if I'm interpreting it correctly, and that is that 
you're, you're, you're going to look for those early adopters to pick up these monitoring equipment. And actually, they're going to be a, you know, like the Prius, you know, you see people with Priuses looking at their ring, looking to, oh, if I accelerate a little bit slower, what's going to, there's sort of this biofeedback mechanism that automatically, right. so, 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 it, you know, you have an interesting dilemma here where, you know, you have the Heisenberg theory, right? It, the, the effect of measuring is going to have such a huge effect on their behavior. Right. Um, you know, it's almost, you're going to have a diff I think you're going to have a fair amount of difficulty resolving that. So That's so. the goal, though, isn't it? Or, well, yeah, we're unless they optimize for the wrong thing. So I can win at this game by, you know, uh, buying a new washing machine or a new refrigerator, and that's true in the short run. It might not be right. true if you looked at it. Right. So you, I think you just need to worry about what you measure and what behavior that's encouraging and whether that's what you want for the long run. Yeah, that, I mean, or even better yet, designing sort of new practices yeah, so, or old practices. So, <laughs> no, you're right. The Prius gauge didn't affect my behavior, but on the other hand, I suppose if you get like one more accident, you know, every every month in Seattle because people are looking at their energy gauge or, <laughs> or saying, "Oh, I, if I just don't break right now, look how much energy." Well, I mean, that's that, what they do. That, that's this whole. But thing. that, but that's actually a good point, and it, you know, that there. there there are um, house call that everybody's always in the hospital with pneumonia. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or it's whatever you know, some other unintended or secondary. Yeah. I mean, technology is filled with these kind of secondary yeah. consequent yeah. use of antibiotics and, and so forth. That that to me is actually a somewhat heartening story because it says that there is still a place for design and uh, human computer interaction, even as these capabilities proliferate and become embedded in the in the other technologies and. Um, I, th I think, you know, that there has been some sign that that Kai has moved in that direction, you know, principally as an influence of the work going on in Schwedek's group and in Landay's group and so forth. But there's others around the country that have sort of taken up that that banner, and I think that's a really interesting take to to start to say, I mean, what do they call it, S sustainable HCI, I think, or something yeah. like that. Um, and yeah, and Ben Van Coffin. Yes, she had Jen and you would be another another example at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Oh, okay. well, I yeah. I'm, I think. Um, yeah, I think this is great. I, all the time, I I have had these questions like the one about computers turning them off or on, or another one was, well, which is better to print twenty copies of something or to print one and photocopy it? And nowadays they're all the same machine, but they used to be, and so maybe doesn't matter at all or maybe well, but so, so the one that we kind of spin over on is is it better to to, to know a hundred people at sort of a fairly lightweight level and consume whatever little bits of energy out there and that and that produces some social utility for me that is some function of that or or should I actually get in the plane and and expend the the jet a and go and have an intense week with you and you know that supercharges me to go back into the into my shop at home, and I invent 20 new technologies that make the world better in a, in a hundred different ways. You know, and, that, and that's that's a kind of a thing that we're trying to to struggle with here. And you know, it's a little bit nerdy, I think, to try to quantify quantify the the nature of these of these bonds. But the point is that we is we don't actually right now. I mean, a lot of social network analysis is really a tie exists or it doesn't. There's, there's not as much effort to sort of try to characterize the, the nature of it in terms of your, your well-being. A lot of, you know, my network analytics friends would stroke out to hear me say this, but I mean, it's, it's a lot of um, Mark Newman, when he does his analyses, he flat out says, I don't actually care what the nodes and the, and the edges are. You know, is, is it physicists? Is it molecular reactions? Is it, you know, grade school kids? Is it high schoolers dating? I don't actually care. I'm interested in the, in the algorithms. But I actually care. I'm interested in what's going on there. And, and I think these kinds of tools are going to give us some insight yeah. into those, into those I, questions. I think there is some, I mean, another one that I've heard people arguing about when I was on the elevator was two people argue about how much energy does using the elevator take? One person says, oh, it uses a lot of energy. And the other person says, no, it's all counterweight balanced and counterweighted and hardly use any at all. Well, if you had a little sign in the elevator that said, you know, it's kind of, this is kind of a metaphor, mm -hmm. I think that would change some people's behavior, unless, of course, it takes almost none. Uh, but I do think, that, so I do think, so I, yeah, I'm very supportive, but I think getting the data out there will change behavior. Well, I mean, the main thing is, 
if I, if I forego a European trip, let's face it, Delta's flying that plane over the ocean whether I go or not. And, uh, and actually, all of us, even whoever is watching remotely, if we all decided not to take those trips, Delta is still flying that plane over the ocean. But if there's some more profound shift, then they maybe they one fewer flight. Right? Yeah, they build smaller planes, uh, or they or they actually they realize that we we care about the efficiency. You know, which is not to say the airline industry isn't focused on efficiency because well, Jet A is yeah, not getting. Well, they, they are so good now packing the planes full. That's clearly been a probably one of the bigger gains for transportation. Right, no, but at, so at, the, at, at the, the expense of the of traveling <laughs> public. Right? Well, and, and there's another one of those Conference things where, you know, into those does the packing, you know, what incidence of viral contagion is amplified <laughs> by, you know, the higher density. We can play these games. Yeah. At it was an interesting one of those TV shotgun studies. All right, thanks. I'll see you over the semester. Sure, definitely. See you later. Which was kind of fun where they, there was a, a group of women that are very uh, adamant about having child seats in implants. Totally, you know, the whole, you know, whole notion of child being in the ceiling is like, just totally horrific and all that stuff. And, well, the, 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 and so they're pushing hard. Now, the consequence of it is that you have to buy an extra car seat. Now, but the consequence of that is a lot of families would not want to do that expenditure, would choose to drive. Choose to drive, the chances of getting hurt or killed are Much higher. astronomically higher than being in that plane and being in their pocket and suddenly hitting the ceiling, right? So here is this sort of, you know, passion dictating, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, desired behavioral uh, the, uh, change to, yep. to the thing that, that the consequences would be totally negative in, in the grander scheme of things. But the, the upfront visualization of your baby hitting the ceiling is so stark and strong that it's so yeah, it's example. including. Yeah, yeah let, what's it? Uh, Freakonomics talks about that. Is that there's some, some things are so visceral, like uh, the kidnapping of a child, mm -hmm. that you just you're, you're you aren't you can't be rational about it. So I, I read this, this woman that writes this this a book about free range children. And she lets her basically the way we, we probably were when we were kids. Is, you know, you leave the house yeah. at seven and you return at nine p.m. Uh, she's saying that um, I think a kid, given the actual risk of abduction. A child would have to stand out on its front lawn for something like a million years before something bad would happen, and and yet the the horror of that is so visceral that it it drives a, a host of related behaviors. Like, do kids walk to school right, anymore? Yeah, yeah that, they don't. that one. Yeah, I'm, that one. That's completely true for me. That completely is. I just can't get that image out, even though I was one of the free-range kids, and yet it's just really hard for me. You know, I was a, it's, it's because of those news stories. It's, that was a very powerful one. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. and no, so, not, which is to that. say that if, if you could implant some of these MEMS into the society, you, it's, 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 I'm, pr I'm pretty optimistic that you could have, it could have dramatic consequence. So clearly this MEM of the abduction has, has now altered the behavior of a ge generation. Of kids, you know, and and as the English teacher friend of mine in the Ann Arbor High School was uh, to tell you the story, he's teaching Tom Sawyer, and he asked his students, yeah, did, yeah. "How how old did they think Tom Sawyer was?" And they all said, he, "He must be 17 or 18." And and why do you think that? Well, because he's going everywhere on his own. He never asked to ask, you know, ask permission. He's completely independent. And from their point of view, that was impossible. Because so things 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 can change. I've, I've wondered if you go how rural do you have to go before it's like it was. Because I grew up more rural, but I grew up in New York and I was reasonably free range too. Well, that's true. When we were in Boston, the was in Boston, I was free range. Yeah, I was free range. I mean, we could, in fact, more so than that. So as you know, the 12, 11, 12 year old, we would take the train to Met Stadium to watch a game. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. Yeah, we would do that on our own because we killed We didn't we hire parents. We didn't work hard. So we would take, you know, the train, you know, it was 25 cents and then getting the game with a bucket. Yeah, you're right. That's what I did in Boston, the same right. age. My younger brother did it, too. Yeah. We yeah. just went any, anywhere we wanted in the yeah. subway. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So I don't know, rural or not, I think it was just it was a different time. And, yeah, so, so my right. dad was talking with my kids about the end of World War II and he said on VJ Day, he got on the train in Chicago and went down just to see the crowds. And 
my eldest son started to do the math and said, you were 11 when you did that. You were gone all day? You know, weren't your parents concerned about you? No? My, my grandfather in New York City dropped out after the second grade to get a job as a messenger boy running stuff around downtown New York City. He, yeah. he was, so he was even younger and he was working. I mean, he was... Yeah, yeah well, at the time, too, um, you, were, you were expected to be more mature faster, right? I mean, right. my folks, eventually, at age 14, school had ended, and they went to work at 14. Right, where now we would, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> in our era, it's like, okay, maybe 26. <laughs>